wherever you are. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you here for this session on life skills for young learners. And what we're going to be doing in the next half hour is looking at what are life skills, why they're important for young learners, and how to go about integrating them into your teaching. And I would also like to share a model with you for um, integrating life skills in your teaching, in your classrooms, that can be helpful. And my focus is on young learners, principally the primary age range, so anyone from about three to pre-adolescence. Although, of course, a lot of what I'm going to be saying um, applies to everyone. So what are life skills? If you could please, in the chat book, box, put um, life skills or words that come to mind when you think of um, chat, skill, uh, chat skills, uh, life skills, if you could experience teamwork, socialization, lovely, okay, fantastic, wonderful, communication, effectively learning how to learn knowledge. Wonderful. Okay, and I would like just to share with you um, this quotation, which I think um, sums up life skills very well. And this is a quotation from the World Health Organization in 1997. And I think I'll just read that out to you now, stressing what I think are the really important things. So life skills are psychosocial abilities for adaptive and positive behavior that enable individuals to deal effectively with the demands and challenges of everyday life and facilitate their physical, mental, and emotional well-being. So I think that we can see from a quotation like that that it's something that we as teachers and educators are very much doing um, anyway. If you like, it's an umbrella term. And it's an umbrella term that covers three main areas. And those are thinking skills, social skills, and personal skills. And UNICEF, UNESCO, and the World um, Health Organization um, have actually identified 10 core life skills that I've color coded here for thinking social and personal. And the, the life skills that they identify are as follow, follows. So 10 core life skills. Under thinking skills, we have critical thinking, creative thinking, decision making, and problem solving. Under social skills, we have the skills of empathy, effective communication, interpersonal relationships. And under personal skills, core skills, self-awareness, coping with stress, and coping with emotions. Now, if you Google life skills, look online, look in the literature, you will find many more skills than that. For example, you will often see things like assertiveness, resilience, um, goal setting, um, time management, planning, as well as intercultural competence identified as life skills as well. So very much um, an umbrella term that embraces those three areas. So why are life skills um, important for our young learners, especially when we're thinking about children who are in a school context who are not yet facing the day-to-day -day challenges of uh, work outside the classroom, for example, why is it important for young learners? And if you'd like to uh, put some of your ideas in the chat box, that would be fantastic. And I would just absolutely recommend they're all important skills. I would like to focus on three uh, main reasons why life skills are important for young learners. First of all, the pressure that young learners face in their everyday context and world today. Many of, of us uh, in our educational context are living in an increasingly uh, pressurized, testing um, culture and exams. And children, even very young children, are under pressure from external exams. There are also pressure from peers, pressure from parents, pressure from the institution. 
and also a whole range of issues to do with children's own self-image, self-concept that they're just in the process of developing, their self-esteem, and of course, um, later on as they get older, um, the onslaught of all the issues to do with fast approaching adolescence. So I think pressure in their everyday context now, it's not just about the future. The second point, the changing focus and demands of the curriculum. As we all know, we're living in a very fast changing 21st century world where knowledge is simply a Google click away. And therefore, increasingly, we're seeing in education system curriculums a focus on the kind of adaptive soft skills that are going to um, enable our children to succeed in a fast-changing environment um, in the future. And the third reason why life skills are important for young learners is to do with laying the foundations for their future uh, lives in a fast-changing world where we perhaps can't predict in every way what it's going to be like. But what we do know is that we're living in an increasingly diverse global world where skills like intercultural competence are going to be crucial and values education is going to help our children negotiate um, a positive life um, journey for themselves. So what and why we've had a, look like, had a look at. So what about how? How do we go about this in our language teaching in our classes? And again, it will be absolutely fantastic if you could keep those ideas pouring into the box because I'm just cho choosing to focus on three um, three ways that we can do it here that seem to me absolutely fundamental. So the first thing that is not rocket science, but it is crucial, that children learn life skills in ways that are appropriate to their age, level, and overall development. Our three-year-olds need to learn um, life skills when they come into a classroom community for the first time and they're no longer king or queen or princess of the castle as they are at home. But the life skills learned by our pre-primary children, are get, we're, they're going to do it in a very different way than our um, pre-adolescents. So age appropriacy is absolutely fundamental. The second point here, by natural integration of life skills with all other aspects of learning. And I think this is really important for us to take on board, that life skills is not something extra that we add on to the curriculum. It is something that is integrated with everything that we do in our classrooms. And in some sense, we can't help teaching life skills just by everything we do in the classroom. But it's not a plus and add-on. It's something that is woven into the very fabric of what we do in the classroom. And the third point here, um, through active, experiential, hands-on learning. There's no point just telling children about the life skills they need. The only way that we will um, enable deep learning to take place is through active, experiential, and hands-on learning and through integration. And this is what I would like us to look at, first of all, in this webinar, that we provide the kind of integration of developing life skills through the kind of activities that we do in our classrooms, for example, through stories, through topic or content-based learning, through role play, through games, through problem-solving activities, and through collaborative learning activities. And I would like us to look in depth, if you like, at an example of one of these activity types to show how we can use that to really unpack and integrate into our teaching um, a range of important life skills. 
And I've chosen to focus on a story for, to do this. And um, this is going to be a, a story, a traditional Indian story, a story about um, how the ti tigers got their stripes. And I would like to set you a little task before we look at the story, before we read the story. And the, your task is, what life skills do you think we can develop through the story? And so we're going to have a look at the story now. And I am actually going to read you the story, because otherwise I think it's quite a lot to absorb just straight from the screen. And as I read it, please keep those ideas coming in the, in the chat box, um, the kinds of life skills that you might develop through this story. OK, so the story, How the Tiger Got Its Stripes. A long time ago, in the days when animals can speak, tigers are white or brown, but they haven't got stripes. And one day, something happens to change this forever. A tiger walks to the edge of the forest. A man is eating his lunch by a rice field. An enormous buffalo is eating grass nearby. The tiger creeps up to the buffalo. Don't be scared. I'm not hungry. I'm curious. You're bigger and stronger than the man. Why do you work for him? The man is more intelligent than I am. What is intelligence? And where does the man get it from? I don't know. Why don't you ask him? The tiger leaps over to the man. The man stands up. He's shaking with fear. What is intelligence? Where do you get it from? Please, can you share it with me? Uh, intelligence is very precious. I don't want to share it with you. Are you sure? I'm feeling hungry. The man is worried. He thinks quickly. My intelligence is at home. Wait here and I can get it. Uh, don't come with me because people in my village are scared of tigers. All right, but make sure you come back or tomorrow I may be hungrier. Uh, I don't want to leave my buffalo with a hungry tiger. Please, can I tie you to this banana tree? The tiger wants the man's intelligence so much that he agrees. The man ties the tiger to the banana tree with thick rope. Ha ha, I'm safe now. Ha ha, with the man's intelligence, I can rule the jungle. Later, the man returns with his son and lots of dry straw. Look, I keep my promises. Here is my intelligence. Really? Is this intelligence? Yes, of course it is. The man and his son lay the straw around the tiger and set it on fire. The tiger breaks the rope and leaps away. Roar! This is cruelty, not intelligence. The tiger races to the river. He swims in the water and cools his fur. Ah, that's better. But look at my fur. I've got orange stripes from the fire and black stripes from the rope. And this is the story of how the tiger got its stripes. It's also the reason why tigers never trust people. And do you know a tiger's stripes are unique, like a person's fingerprints. Stripes also help tigers to hide in the forest. So that's our story. And this is a story, a traditional story from India. It's obviously not a realistic story. It's magical realism, if you like. And I'm just having a quick look at some of the things that you've said here about the story. 
And I'm sure you've been thinking a lot about the kinds of life skills that we could develop through the story. Um, we obviously can't go through everything, but let's have a look at some of those now. So there we have stories in the middle. We've had the example with the tiger and some of the life skills that we can develop around. So take, for example, problem solving. After the uh, moment in the story when the man is worried and he thinks quickly, what we might do is stop our telling of the story there and actually ask the children what can he do to get out of this dilemma. The children could solve the problem in groups and come up with the best solution. In terms of creative thinking, well, of course, the problem solving will lead to creative thinking in itself. But we might use this story as the springboard for children to write in their own creative story, how the elephant got its trunk, for example. And I saw someone in the chat box was um, making reference to uh, Rudyard Kimpley and jungle stories there. So actually uh, the making reference, uh, creating their own stories. In terms of collaborating, for example, our children could work on those two activities that I've mentioned together. In terms of critical thinking, this story is very rich and throws up a lot of discussion areas. What is intelligence anyway? And is the man cruel or clever? Is it okay to be cruel with a dilemma like that? Is it fair to play tricks on other people? When is it fair to play tricks on other people? What kind of tricks are okay to play? And what kinds constitute um, bullying. Is there a moral to the story? What would the moral be? So you can see how um, a traditional story like that actually poses intellectual and philosophical inquiry that children are very participative in. I've had children, for example, tell me that it doesn't matter what intelligence is, it's what you do with it that's important. Well, that is amazing. Similarly, to do with self-awareness, children becoming aware of their own intelligence and how they use it. Intercultural competence, perhaps in this sense, to do with making the children aware that all different countries and cultures have their own wealth of traditional stories. Sometimes I think children just think it's only their culture that, that has those. Empathy, empathy with, um, empathy with the man in the initial stages of the story when he's threatened by the tiger and empathy later with the tiger when he's the victim of the man's um, cruel trip, trick. Self-esteem, self-esteem very often through actually um, allowing children the opportunity to respond to the story in a personal way and making it clear that uh, there are no right answers to that, that everyone has a personal response that is valued within the context of um, the classroom community. Learning to learn. For example, some of you may notice that that story has a number of comparative adjectives in it. So we might actually go back to the story and find examples of those and the grammar detectives in working out the rules for the different comparative ad adjectives, stronger, hungrier, more intelligent, um, etc. So I think, I hope that you can see from that um, how a story can be a vehicle, not just for um, communicative language development, although of course it's rich for that too, but also for developing a whole lot of life skills that are embedded in the content of the story and can be 
teased out in the way that we use our materials and exploit them. And just to finish this sec section of the webinar with a quotation about the kinds of stories that is most enriching and rewarding for us to use in our classes, this little quotation from Bettelheim's classic book back in 1975, but republished again in 2010. And he says, for a story truly to hold children's attention, it must entertain them and arouse their curiosity. And that's very often where stories stop. But to enrich their lives, it must stimulate their imagination, help them to develop their intellect, and to clarify their emotions. And so when we're selecting stories to use with our children, I think we need to think beyond just entertainment, just arousing their curiosity, but to use stories that embed um, life skills that are going to um, enrich their thinking, appeal to their imaginations, and um, and they, they will respond emotionally in a way that makes the story and the language memorable. Now, of course, I could demonstrate the same idea using that web that we just looked at with stories for topic or content-based learning, for projects, for role play, for games, for problem-solving activities, or other collaborative learning activities. And I think very often we can unpack the materials that we're using in class and take them further, make more mileage out of them rather than just focusing on the language elements that they contain. However, I think for those of us who see our role as educators and want to um, in enrich our teaching by paying attention to life skills, um, a model that I would like to share with you that is very uh, simple in one sense but extremely helpful for ensuring that we integrate um, life skills um, in all our lessons. And this is the 4-H model of life skills and I've put the reference for you down there and actually if you go and have a look and Google it, this is a model of life skills um, designed essentially for adults and unpacked in micro detail. However, I think in terms of our working with children or actually working with anyone, it gives us a good framework for thinking about the kinds of life skills that we want to focus on. And the four H's here refer to head, heart, hands, and health. So head to do with thinking skills, critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, uh, academic thinking, um, possibly the area that we're often best at focusing on as teachers. Heart to do with empathy, to do with concern for others, to do with intercultural competence and aspects of that, such as respect for differences, for diversity, for tolerance, and heart also to do with motivation and participation, which of course is really important when our children first start out on their language learning journey. Hands are to do with the way we work and collaborate with others. So to do with the way our abilities to work as a team, to um, also communicate effectively, and to be um, responsible citizens. And health, of course, um, perhaps not in a literal sense, although in some contexts, of life skills, it would be in very much in a literal sense, um, but certainly to do with, in our context, very often to do with children's developing self-concept, their sense of self-esteem, their sense of 
competence um, and also very often to do with um, lifestyle choices and issues to do with uh, it might be healthy food, personal hygiene, that kind of thing. So what I would like us to look at now in the time we've got left is some examples of activity types that illustrate um, this kind of model. So to start off then with head, um, I've chosen to show you an activity here that um, I like very much. I've used it many, many times uh, in different contexts with different children, normally between the ages of about 9 and 12. And the, in this activity, make five squares. Uh, you have five children in the group. Um, you give them each a set of um, colored uh, cards. And they take turns. You, you obviously um, prepare the ground by teaching vocabulary, the word shape. You might also teach um, rectangle, square, triangle. Um, and then the language that you want um, the children to use in the activity, let's put the green rectangle here. I think we should put um, the red triangle here, for example. And the, uh, the objective of the game is to make five squares um, out of those shapes. And it's very challenging for the children, and it's very enjoyable. And what I usually also do is build in a rule that you actually can't have a turn or move one of your pieces unless you make the suggestion in, it, in, in English. Um, another, uh, another way of doing this um, activity is actually um, to also have a second kind of puzzle, um, similar in design but different. And two pairs make the different puzzles. They find the solution and then um, dictate the solution to the, other, to the other pair. So I'm sure it's very difficult for you to do this visually from the screen. You really need to be holding these pieces of paper, card, and moving them around the table. So I'll put you out of your agony and show you um, the solution. Okay, the solution to this puzzle, and a wonderful follow-up to this, which children really enjoy doing, is to make their own similar puzzle, which they then bring back, and others of us do. But one of the things I just would like to point out here is the source of this activity. This activity um, actually comes from a book from developing geography skills. Um, and we can see how it's helping children's thinking, learning visual-spatial relationships. And I think one of the things in terms of developing life skills is very often to look for our resources and materials outside of the narrow confines or narrower confines of an ELT um, context to develop these life skills. The other area I wanted to mention in terms, I can see that um, time is going very very quickly here, um, in terms of uh, the head part of the model, is to do with learning to learn and study skills. Now, these are just a couple of examples here, so they, re they really are just meant to be examples. But the, the key thing here is to build in, from a very early age, um, the developing children's metacognitive skills skills, their ability to reflect on their own learning. So to actually think about their learning, what they've done, and how it helped them to learn, and why. And here at the bottom, under number nine, you have a little example of study skills. This particular one is about vocabulary, but it might be about learning grammar, about reading, about listening, about speaking. And what we're actually doing there is encouraging the children to think about their learning and to develop strategies that learn to them. Similarly, here we have um, can-do statements, self-assessment, that you're very familiar with, with that, I'm sure. But the importance of this regular review and thinking about their progress, and not just thinking backwards, but thinking forwards, making a learning plan what am I going to do to make sure that what I've learnt 
I remember? And also, what was, what was I interested in? What do I plan to find out more about? So study skills, really important part of the head element of the 4-H um, life skill model. Moving on very quickly um, to, to heart, and here are some images from pre-primary. But I think this is a crucial life skill at the start of children's learning journey, that they feel motivated, competent, and confident in participating. And that there is a link between what they do at school and what they do at home. So for example, that they learn that the kind of nursery rhymes that I'm sure you all recognize, Humpty Dumpty and Hickory Dickory Dot, they are familiar with things like that in their own language and can enjoy and participate in them um, in English as well. However, if you remember my point of age appropriacy, it is truly important that we um, get that kind of engagement and participation, we pitch it at the right level. So for example, with older children, we might be using an app like Telegami that I'm sure many of you are familiar with to engage our children in participating in English. This is a lovely app where, they can, where children can customize their character and um, for many children getting a bit older, they feel much more comfortable and confident recording, for example, uh, a description of their town or their daily routine or any, anything you like, but through um, their avatar rather than through themselves. Um, of course, also, to, we have values education, attitudes and values education, which is part of the heart um, bit of the um, 4-H life skill model. We use songs a lot in our young learner classroom. And of course, there's many reasons for using songs to do with language learning. But songs can also very often be um, a wonderful vehicle for values education. Here are the words of a song up here, which I'm not about to sing to you, but I will just um, show you the text of it there, to do with um, values of um, protecting the countryside and the chorus, which is paper, plastic bags, bottles and cans. And what we do is get our children to use recycled yogurt pots and beans, etc., to make um, shakers to go um, with the song. So actually finding songs and using songs um, that uh, help to develop life skills of um, positive values and um, attitudes towards the environment. But of course, there are m many, many other areas that we want to develop as well, such as um, anti-bullying, inclusion, not leaving, not children not being left out, um, racial tolerance. And this particular song, we could also, um, we could also go on to do some content work on recycling. Intercultural understanding is crucial underpinning um, of um, life skills for children. And when children reach the kind of age where they have the cognitive skills necessary to be able to compare and contrast, something that's really valuable to do is to um, get the children in areas, this for example is just an image of where children are comparing, where, where children are finding out about um, kind of canteen lunch that children have in a British school context and using a kind of a quite simple um, before, during and after methodology, the children look at what happens in the UK and compare it with what they do. And of course, as well as opening children's minds to the fact that um, other children in other contexts and cultures do things differently, it also plays a very important role of um, reinforcing their sense, their own sense of identity. OK, moving on very rapidly now um, to hands. The thing that I really wanted to stress here is the importance of 
building up the skills that children have for effective communication in English in the classroom. That this is a kind of real here and now life skills that our children learning a foreign language need. And you know, so often what happens, people say, oh, children must speak English in class, but actually do not give them the skills training and tools that they need to be able to do that effectively. And so in terms of um, working together and encouraging collaboration and also encouraging um, listening to each other as well. So focusing on skills of working together is um, hugely important. Moving on now to health to the last category in the model, and this area here of developing a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset really overlaps um, with hands and also heart. And this is based on the work of Carol Dweck, the reference is at the bottom of the slide there, and developing a growth mindset is vital for children in terms of a life skill. And actually, it's also important for all of us and as teachers as well. Carol Dweck's research is essentially into the underpinnings of human motivation and how people persevere after setbacks, why some people are persistent and go on trying and others give up. And so children or adults or anyone with a fixed mindset believe that their intelligence is a fixed trait that you have a fixed amount of it, and if you encounter a problem that you can't resolve or a challenge that you can't meet, you think it's a reflection of you and you give up. And this is in contrast to a growth mindset where children, people, believe that their intelligence can be developed through effort and hard work. So in contrast to being helpless oriented, it is really um, mastery oriented. So that children with a growth mindset, um, challenges are energizing rather than intimidating because they offer opportunities to learn. And as teachers, and many of us, I'm sure there are many of you out there who are also parents, we foster particular mindsets by the kind of feedback and praise that we give to our children. And although there's not time to go into this in a lot of detail now, the important thing to bear in mind is to focus when you're giving praise, not, not just on, you know, what a wonderful bit of work this is, but the effort and the persistence that has gone into doing it and to show that you value, um, that you value the effort that children um, make. In terms of health, of course, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, health might be focusing more directly on health issues and lifestyle choices. And so here is just a little um, example of that, uh, a rainbow. I think it's rather, it's, uh, I always think of it as quite a fun way of thinking about getting the kind of um, nutrients you need from food and can lead to quite a fun uh, chain game, a rainbow chain game where you name uh, fruit and vegetables of different um, colors. Um, so that also and um, also extends to other areas um, such as getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, personal hygiene, all those kinds of areas that are very often um, touched upon um, in, in materials that we use and can help to reinforce not just language learning but important um, life skills. Okay, so just to recap then on what we've looked at in this seminar, in this webinar, um, we've looked at a way of integrating the development of life skills through activity types that we are using in our lessons. And we had a look at the example of the story. And we've also had a look uh, very briefly, albeit very briefly, but at the 4-H model of life skills, which I think gives us a framework for categorizing and situating 
the kinds of skills that we want to um, integrate into our language teaching and for our children to develop. So my final message in this webinar is this. Um, integrate life skills into your classroom and make a real difference to the lives and learning of children you teach. I think through taking a holistic view of teaching and learning and recognizing that you are an educator and not just a language teacher, if you like, you will not only deepen and enrich children's language learning, but also help to equip them with the skills they need to adapt flexibly to fast-changing circumstances and lead their lives in a positive and fulfilled way. So that really brings me to the end of the webinar, but I'll be delighted to answer any questions. Uh, thank you all very much. If anyone has any questions, do you want to put them in the chat box? I see lots of questions about certificates here. I think Henry will deal with that. Any, what was that? Any sites we should get? Yes, there are. There are some wonderful sites for world um, fairy tales, stories from the world. I can't remember exactly, but if you Google um, stories from around the world, you will get some, some lovely um, ideas. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? What was this? Tips? Ah, my teaching for children aged three or four years old. Um, well, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because life skills for children of three or four, four years old are actually crucially important. And I think um, we are going to embed them in everything that we do um, in, in our teaching. For example, just a very little example, when you're sitting in a circle with pre-primary children and basically all of them want to come and sit on your lap, but it's not possible for that to happen, so you want them to stay back. Rather than saying, stay back, stay back, give a reason, stay back, Daniel, Jenny can't see, so that you're constantly kind of making that link between what a very egocentric three-year-old wants with actually beginning to have an awareness of others around them that they need to learn to respect to. Is it possible to work with these tips with adults? Well, actually, I mean, in many ways, I think that a lot of what I've said this afternoon applies at any age group. I mean, I can think, for example, of taking a story, maybe a story with a metaphor for adults, for business, uh, for business students, and actually looking at the kind of critical thinking and creative thinking skills that would come out of it in exactly the same way. One of the keys here is age appropriacy and making sure that um, what you are challenging children to do is appropriate for their age. And one of the things that I've learned over, over many years, more years than I care to admit to these days, is that children are so often capable of more than we give them credit for. Um, I, I, not sure whether I've got time to say this now, but I, 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 rem I always remember a wonderful experience that I had, um, it's quite a long time ago now, at a conference in Croatia where I was asked, we were, we were asked, presenters were asked if they would actually teach a real class of children. And so I did this completely terrifying session where I had 30 children I'd never met in my life and whose language I spoke not one word of. And, um, and 90 teachers watching me do it. And I did a storytelling session with them. And um, I, I read a story to them that some of you may know. It's a puffin story. It's called Something Else. And it's about excluding a child and about bullying and about difference. And these children had just come through the, the Balkans War. 
and some of the things that came that they came up with to do with how humans treat each other and behave towards each other was astounding and during the lesson I forgot about the other teachers there I was just listening to the children and from that time I've learned that we don't have to hold back from asking children difficult questions like what is intelligence uh, because they, they are very thoughtful and they usually um, surprise us with their maturity. What else? What are adults? Resources. Any other resources I re recommend? Well, I think with my example from the geography, um, the geography curriculum, I think very often it is useful to look at other areas of the curriculum and the kinds of um, thinking skills and cognitive demands that other subjects make. And of course, that's not always, you know, you can't always transfer that literally to a language teaching classroom but very often you can get um, ideas that will integrate um, life skills with language skills. Any more questions there? Folk tales would be very good. American Indians, that's a lovely idea. Um, how to control students when we tell a story if they're very active. Well, I think uh, one of the rules of thumb is to always do different things with stories. I mean, you as a teacher want the children to come back to the story more than once, but if you do it in the same way the second time, they will say, no, 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 we did it like this before, that's boring. So we always have to have that aha factor so that there is a surprise, there's something to motivate them. This could be very, very simple. It might be example, you know, putting your hand on your head every time you hear a particular word or using a very simple cutout. Or, for example, um, if you've got a recording of the story, using a recording of the story or using a digital version of the story if you, if you have that. But I think variety and flexibility is key because although children at home want a story again and again, sitting on your lap, in a classroom context, they want that freshness and variety um, to, uh, to carry on uh, being engaged in what you're doing. Sorry, I'm reading questions at the same time. A webinar about developing critical thinking. Yes, I think um, critical thinking is a hugely important skill for our students and it also demands very special competences from us as teachers because we need to be able to have the skill to lead the questioning from, if you like, um, lower order thinking skills, things to do with recall and understanding, through to higher level skills such as critical thinking, creative thinking, evaluating and, and so on in terms of Bloom's um, taxonomy that I'm sure you're familiar with. And actually I think as teachers, um, being aware of the kinds of questions we ask, who we ask them to and when we ask them is crucial in um, fostering that, um, in that, that, that fostering a kind of classroom atmosphere in which critical thinking is valued and, w and in which you're constantly um, probing and pushing and challenging um, your children to think um, in, in, in different ways and at the same time giving them the, the skills, doing the skill building that is necessary for them to be able to um, transfer a lot of that and use English. Uh, I'm still looking, this, I can't keep up with all the questions. Um, any more? Any more questions? The level of English with children. The level 
uh, it's hugely important. And one of the main, one a big advantage here is those of you, and there are probably many of you here, there who do actually understand the first language of your children. Um, because when you do do that, you have another resource which is available for you. And I'm not suggesting here that all your discussion and so on takes place in the children's first language, but you can use techniques like recasting and recapping and um, possibly, you know, translation of a particular word if it's going to take you, you know, five minutes to explain it through mime. You, you do have that kind of added advantage. And yet, in the other way, it is also an advantage when you don't speak the children's language. The children I was talking to you about in Croatia, I genuinely spoke not a word of their language. So they used every ounce of resource that they had available to get their meaning across to me about how strongly they felt about how idiotic humankind is um, to do things like ha have wars. And that was um, fantastic. OK, yes, Oxfam and Christian Aid have, have, have excellent resources. That's true. Great. OK, Henry. Thank you, Carol. Sorry. Um, We'll probably have to end it there because there's so many questions. Right. I think we could carry on all, all day, but... Uh, I, can't, uh, I, can't, yeah, I, can't, I can't actually capture um, all the questions, but if, if, there's, if there's any particular one you uh, well, want to answer, just let me know. Um, to tell you the truth. Um, let's see if there's any more in. I think it's all just nice positive messages coming in now for you, Karen. That's Lots lovely. Feedback. So that's lovely. Like that talk's gone down very well. I'll stop the recording and then we can say goodbye.